probably may. He's going to uh, give us a tour, an armchair tour of Antarctica this, uh, this evening. Uh, if you have any questions after the program, I'm sure he'll be able to answer anything that you have. Um, and if you need to use the restroom, I, instead of using this one, you let me know, and then I'll take you out around and you can use the one that's in the workroom. Uh, if you need to leave early, please uh, exit by that door back there and get up here. So if you have any questions right now, no? Okay. Robbie, thank you for coming this evening, and we're anxious to see what your presentation is. Yep, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Robbie May. I grew up here in Western Port uh, and currently live in LaVale, so not too far away. Uh, Kathy asked me to do this presentation probably over a year ago now, uh, but those of you who know me know that I am all the time all over the place and I'm very busy, so it's been hard to kind of get it together. And then finally, I've got a little bit of a lull in my schedule right now. Um, so I'll start by telling you I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor either. I have not studied Antarctica in college, so be careful how hard your questions are to me. Uh, I won't lie to you, though. I'll just tell you I don't know the answer. Uh, so um, I'll do my best to kind of uh, answer any kind of questions that you have. It's definitely the most amazing experience that I've ever had in my life. I've been pretty lucky to um, travel a good many places around the world. I have two continents left that I haven't made it to yet, which is Africa and uh, Australia, and hope to make it to those um, right after that. Um, other big places I've been, I spent the summer uh, right before COVID started in China. Oh. I got super sick in China with a respiratory virus and had to actually be hospitalized while I was there. And then the joke is with like a lot of my uh, friends and stuff was that I brought COVID back with me uh, because uh, I was sick all that fall with respiratory stuff as well too. Um, I've spent time in Israel. I wouldn't want to be there right now, but was there a, a few years ago. Lots of different places in Europe uh, as well. So prior to being in the position that I am right now, um, I taught uh, middle school and high school social studies for 13 years. Uh, I started in North Carolina. I moved away after I graduated from Frostburg. And then um, after a few years there, moved back to the area and started teaching in Allegheny County. I taught at uh, Fort Hill High School um, while I was here in Allegheny County. And then um, as COVID happened, uh, with all the other normal stresses of being a teacher, uh, I said I had enough. <laughs> um, I love teaching. I love teaching the kids. I love teaching history. Um, but as you know, if you have anybody in your family that's a teacher, there's a lot of stress that, that comes with it. Uh, and I just said it's time for, for a change for me. So luckily, I have another background as well, too. Um, I've been, started as a volunteer in emergency services when I was in high school, and then I uh, got my degree in paramedicine a few years ago. And so now I work for Howard County Fire, and I oversee our paramedic education there. So first, let's talk about how I got to uh, Antarctica here. So um, a lot of the travel that I've done has been completely free um, because there are a ton of really cool fellowships for teachers in the summertime that are competitive where teachers can apply for them, et cetera. And so um, probably eight years ago now, I saw that National Geographic had a teaching fellowship um, for teachers that were National Geographic certified, which is a a little bit of a process to go through, um, mostly for social studies teachers. They were teaching geography, other social subjects, things like that. And then you could apply for this competitive process. So what it's called is um, uh, the Grossvener Teacher Fellowship. It started in 2006, and it was actually a, gro uh, a gift from uh, um, Sven Lindblad, who owns Lindblad Expeditions. And he gifted it to the... Uh, uh, Gilbert Grosvenor, who was the chair of the National Geographic Society for years and years and years, and who really had a passion for education. And so basically what it is, is they take generally um, 20 to 40, it depends uh, from year to year, teachers from across the United States and pair them with National Geographic explorers, so scientists of all sorts of backgrounds, and send them on expeditions uh, using Lindblad's ships that are under the National Geographic name all over the world. 
And so um, I was awarded the fellowship in the spring of 2020, literally two days before the school shut down uh, and the world changed for, for COVID. So very quickly, you know, we learned that uh, we were not going anywhere that summer. And so the next year, everything was kind of on hold. And um, so we kind of were thinking that maybe we'd get to go in the summer of 2021, 20, but I didn't yet know where I was going to go to because they hadn't paired us up. And uh, that year went on. Um, we still uh, were not knowing where we were going to go yet. And uh, then in January of 2021 was when I made the decision to make a career change. So I was very sad because it's like, I'm going to lose this expedition um, that I don't know where it's going to be to um, and I'm not going to have that opportunity. So anyways, um, I emailed National Geographic and I told them and they're like, no worries, we're still sending you because we expected that many teachers are going to make a, a life change uh, with their career. Um, during COVID. And so anybody that made that left teaching, which was actually a good proportion of, of our class, um, was still allowed to uh, do their expedition. So um, I was then assigned to go to Alaska in the fall of 2021 on an expedition, which I was pretty excited for. I've actually not been to Alaska. I mean, it's not like uh, some of the other crazy places that they go to around the world. Um, but I was happy to go on a free trip uh, and, and have the opportunity to travel and explore. And so then in the fall 2021, if you remember, we had a surge in COVID. So they decided, okay, nope, we're not sending anybody again. So we had to wait another year. Um, so 2022 is coming up. And one day I got a call and they said, hey, we have a, we're ready to send you on an expedition. Um, but we're going to do a different location, but it's going to be for about a month. Um, and so uh, are you okay with being gone for a month? So I talked with my employer, which at that point was Howard County, uh, and they were like, yes, it's not a problem, da, 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 da. And then they told me we were going to Antarctica. And I was like, oh, wow, like I never would have thought uh, I've had the opportunity to, to go to Antarctica. So every um, teacher fellow is uh, paired with another uh, teacher. Um, and so usually what happens is in the spring before your fellowship, you go to Washington, D.C., National Geographic headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, you get to learn a lot about um, not only the mission of National Geographic, but they teach you some photography skills as well because of the places you're going to go, get to know your uh, person that you're traveling with, et cetera. That didn't happen because of COVID. So we kind of did a bunch of virtual things online. Unfortunately, um, just about a month prior, the person that I was paired with, um, who was from out west, um, was actually vacationing with his family uh, on Lake Michigan, and he saved a kid that was drowning, but in the process drowned himself. Um, and so then there was another delay. They're like, We're, we have to repair you, but you're still going to Antarctica. And so I ended up actually being um, placed with a, another National Geographic staffer who works in the Education Department National Geographic. And so you'll see some pictures of him uh, and I together because it's very cool. He, was, he also had just left the classroom and started working for National Geographic. So it was a very cool opportunity to spend to, together. So first, I'm going to start with a little bit of like the background of Antarctica, some of the history. And then, of course, I'll go into my presentation on um, with pictures and all that. And feel free at any point to stop me and ask any kind of questions. Like I said, I don't guarantee that I'll know all the answers, but I'll do the best that I can. So if you look at this world map on the screen, um, you probably can pick up without being a geographer that the world doesn't look that way. Uh, but that's what we thought the world looked like in the 1700s. Okay, and this is after, you know, we figured out that you don't fall off the edge of the world, although there are still people out there that believe that today. Okay, but you don't fall off the edge of the world that there are uh, uh, continents past the Atlantic Ocean, etc. And so explorers always knew as early as the the 1400s, that there was a continent on the southern part of the globe, but no one had actually seen it yet. Um, they guessed that based on seeing things like birds, etc. And so um, the problem was getting there, A, because of how cold uh, and the ice that you got as you got close to the land, but also some of the currents, which I'll talk about, which makes the journey even today to Antarctica the roughest sea journey in the, the world. So finally, in 1820, the Russians found uh, Antarctica. They were the first uh, uh, country to actually sight it. And then within two or three months after that, 
Uh, Great Britain saw, had a ship that sighted it, and then the United States had a ship that sighted it. The first person to actually set foot on the continent was in 1853, and it was not even an explorer, it was just a sealer. Because if you remember, in the 1800s, we were hunting seas and, we and um, whales pretty heavily. What's the reason for that? Any room? No? Oil. Oil, because that's how we lit our homes, kerosene uh, lamps, things like that. Uh, and so it was a huge, huge uh, trade for a long time. In 1890, it's finally given the name Antarctica. And so the, the term Antarctica and why it's called that, it's two things from the Greek. Number one, it means opposite of Arctic, since it's the Arctic's in the north and Antarctica's in the south. It also means without bear. Um, so a lot of people, when I first came back, would ask me, did you see any polar bear? Uh, and I always am like, nope. They were a year closer to polar bear than what I am, um, because there are no polar bear in Antarctica. All the polar bear in the world are north of us uh, in the, the Arctic. So hence why it's without bear. Oh, sorry, just let someone in and then knock myself off. So we finally start to explore Antarctica in the late 1800s. And so what they call this period of Antarctic exploration is the heroic age, because you had to either be heroic or crazy to do it. Uh, and so in 1898, um, they began what was called the Southern Cross Expedition with the idea of actually overwintering in Antarctica. And so they were the first group, and this is an actual picture that uh, was taken of that expedition. Obviously, photography has come a long way since then. And uh, they were the first group to overwinter for uh, a year. They utilized sled dogs, uh, which was very common during this time period to get around and to try to start to explore and map uh, Antarctica. I won't pronounce this Swedish uh, explorer because they kept saying it to me multiple times when we visited. Uh, this is his hut that is still standing that I visited and took a picture of. Um, but he, in uh, 1903, um, took a Swedish crew to um, what was supposed to be one winter uh, in Antarctica. Uh, the problem was is that they um, ended up there a little bit too late in the year. And so, as would happen to many of the ships that went, their ship got trapped in the ice, and then the ice just crushed it. So they came here on to, to land, and they were stranded, and they built this hut in 1903, which is still standing to this day. As you can see, it, they kind of keep it up with some uh, supports on the side. And actually, they had just finished building uh, like the erosion kind of control that you're seeing there. Um, I was able to go up and see in the hut. It's very interesting. It's all wood. Uh, you know, some of their belongings and things are still in there. It's well preserved because it's very dry for the most part. And I'll talk about the, the climate piece with Anta uh, Antarctica here in just a second as well. So the problem was is that they ended up here on Snow Hill Island, which is in the Antarctic Peninsula, um, but they couldn't go any further because of the ice pack. So this is one place where we can definitely see change. So today we can go several hundred miles further south um, because the oceans have warmed so much and all that ice has melted. But back then, 100 years ago, you could not go any further south, especially prior to the, uh, to the icebreakers, things like that. So um, a couple things ended up happening, making it go from bad to worse. First, their sled dogs that they had brought ended up getting loose, uh, and then they ate nearly all their food stores. So now they were in even bigger trouble. And so as several of the expeditions that had the same kind of fate, they ended up having to hunt uh, seal and penguin and basically survive off of the blubber, um, which, of course, I've never eaten. But if you read all their uh, journals and things like that, it tasted terrible uh, in the process. And it's also what they would use to burn to heat, because obviously there's not wood that you're gathering. And um, when you burn, my understanding is, is when you burn that blubber, uh, it's very, very dirty. And so everything's just coated in this black oil almost. Uh, so that's a, another thing. When you see those old pictures, you'll see them. It looks like they come out of the coal mines, um, but it's that oil that's all, all over them from, from burning that. 
So uh, things went from bad to worse for them because a rescue ship was sent to them and the same thing happened to the rescue ship. So they ended up having to spend a second summer, uh, in, or excuse me, a second winter in uh, Antarctica prior to them finally being uh, rescued. So then once we started to uh, map the area and have some people overwinter there, the next big step in exploration was reaching the South Pole. And so there was a big race to reach the South Pole, and this was just a little over 100 years ago, because this really kicked off in the early 1900s. So you had two racing uh, groups that were trying to reach the South Pole in 1910. One was a Norwegian explorer named um, Rolled on Umbensen, which one of the bases is named at the South Pole is named for him now. And the other one is uh, Robert Scott, who the base is also named after uh, there at the South Pole from the British. So Admundsen ends up reaching the South Pole first in 1911. Um, Scott ends up reaching it about 13 days later. Okay. However, um, while Scott reached the South Pole, he did not reach it back to the ship. He and his whole crew starved to death and froze to death uh, on their way back to the, the ship. So when they sent the rescue party to look for Scott, they ended up finding their bodies. And um, next to them, they found 35 pounds of fossils, like the ones that you're seeing here, of trees and leaves, et cetera, which proved that at one point in human history, Antarctica was not cold. It was a green climate, uh, and it was, had mammals, et cetera, just like we, expect, we see you know, in our backyard today. So those fossils were uh, taken back to Great Britain. Of course, there's been further study since then. There's a couple different videos I want to show you throughout this. This is the longest one. This is about nine minutes long, but it kind of gives you a little bit of the background on what Antarctica was like prior to being the fo fo frozen content. So we're going to watch that now. It's the world's most remote and isolated continent. It's home to glaciers, mountains, plants, and penguins. But today, Antarctica is noteworthy for what it doesn't have. In modern Antarctica, there aren't any trees or native terrestrial mammals, reptiles, or amphibians at all. But it wasn't always like this. Thanks to plate tectonics, Antarctica has been connected to lots of other continents at various points in deep time. As a matter of fact, before the start of the Eocene Epoch, about 56 million years ago, Antarctica was still joined to both Australia and South America. And the fossil record tells us that in the early Eocene, Antarctica was a warm, forested place, very different from the continent we know today. Palm trees thrived there, as did flowering plants, dung beetles, and even a number of hooped mammals and marsupials. And because of the way it was situated, Antarctica probably served as an important migration path for the ancestors of some of the Southern Hemisphere's most charismatic mammals, like wallabies and kangaroos. Eventually, of course, the lush environment of Eocene Antarctica transitioned into the cold, glacier-covered landmass that it is today, isolated from the rest of the world by the most powerful ocean currents on the planet. But it turns out that a lot of what we recognize about the Southern Hemisphere, including those famously unique animals of Australia, can be traced back to the time when Antarctica was green. If you could travel back in time and visit Antarctica in the Eocene Epoch, the first thing you'd notice would probably be the greenery. Off the coast of Wilkie's Land in eastern Antarctica, scientists have discovered sporomorphs, fossilized pollen and spores from ancient palm trees and ferns. They've also found pollen from other plants that often live in tropical environments today. The traces of these warm weather plants can tell us a lot about what Antarctica was like back then. Since these palms and other trees can't tolerate the cold very well, Paleontologists think that in the early Eocene, the coast of Wilkie's land experienced very mild winters with little to no frost. By one estimate, the mean annual temperature of that part of Antarctica was around 16 degrees Celsius, with an average winter temperature of around 11 degrees Celsius. So how could ancient Antarctica have been so warm? Well, for one thing, the Eocene wasn't the first time that Antarctica's climate was so mild. Scientists have found sporomorphs and other fossils from warm weather plants in Antarctica that date back way to the Devonian period, more than 358 million years ago. And in the early Jurassic period, about 190 million years ago, Antarctica was a temperate home for dinosaurs like the long-necked Glacialosaurus and Crylolophosaurus, a crested carnivore. In those days, Antarctica was just one small chunk of the supercontinent Gondwana, and it was located 
located a little farther north than it is now. But by about 100 million years ago, most of the landmass that would become Antarctica had migrated to the bottom of the world. By the early Eocene, the western part of Antarctica had just split from the tip of South America, but the eastern part was still mostly linked to Australia. And right around this time, the world was going through a dramatic heat spike. This event is known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, and we did a whole episode about it. Because the theories about what caused it and what made it stop are really complex and fascinating and a little scary. During this period, the global average temperature increased by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in 220,000 years or less. And as the world's climate changed, so did its flora and fauna. Tropical trees like palms as well as ferns and tree ferns were able to spread onto every continent, including Antarctica. And mind you, Antarctica is a really big place. Like, the entire country of Australia can easily fit inside its boundaries. So given its size, it was able to support many different ecosystems in the Eocene. Farther inland and at higher elevations, sporomorphs and leaf impressions have been found from plants that are normally found in temperate rainforests, like the southern beech trees. It's also been suggested that some areas even experienced monsoons, getting more than 60% of their annual rainfall in the summer. And of course, plants didn't have the whole continent to themselves. On Seymour Island off the Antarctic Peninsula, paleontologists have recovered brood balls of ancient dung beetles. These are balls of dung that female beetles lay their eggs into. So if these beetles were rolling dung balls around, where did that poop come from? Well, some of it came from ancient marsupials. Fragmentary remains and isolated teeth tell us that a number of these little mammals lived in western Antarctica. Judging by their teeth, it seems that some of them belong to the same order of marsupials as the modern colo colo possum, a small and adorable insect eater that's native to South America. Another Antarctic marsupial was Antarctodolops. First described in 1984, this possum-like critter was the first terrestrial mammal ever discovered in the continent's fossil record. Its ancestors most likely came over from South America. Other residents of Eocene Antarctica probably came from South America as well. For example, a single contentious toe bone suggests that Xenarthrins, the group of mammals that includes modern-day sloths, might have lived in Antarctica. Xenarthrins originally evolved in South America, as did the forerunners of a herbivore that's been found in Western Antarctica called Noteolophos. The teeth of this creature tell us that it was a browser, stripping twigs off of tree branches and maybe eating the occasional sapling. Not many specimens have been found, but we do know there were at least two species of Noteolophos in Antarctica. Judging by the sizes of their teeth, the bigger of these ungulates weighed up to 230 kilograms, while its smaller cousin was about one-fourth that size. And the fact that these two species had such different sizes means that they might have both been specialists, eating different types of plants to avoid direct competition with each other. Another big hoofed mammal known from Eocene deposits in West Antarctica is Antarctodon, or Antarctic tooth. Scientists think that it was a kind of a strapophere, an unusual group of extinct and mostly South American herbivores. The only Antarctodon fossils that have turned up so far are teeth, but more complete skeletons of other astrapotheres show that these animals looked kind of like tapers. Some species had self-sharpening canine teeth and ate a combination of soft plants and hard nuts. Others may have been semi-aquatic like modern-day hippos. And paleontologists think Antarctodon was yet another animal whose ancestors crossed into Antarctica from South America. So these and the other animals that shared their prehistoric habitat are extremely important to paleontologists. Because Antarctica's fossil record isn't as comprehensive as those on other continents, and many of the bones we do find are isolated or fragmentary. Still, the coexistence of all these Eocene creatures tells us that Antarctica was home to a variety of land mammals. But why isn't that the case anymore? What happened to green Antarctica? Well, while Antarctica's land mammals were still kicking around, some pretty big changes loomed on the horizon. Scientists are still working out the timeline of events, but they think that by about 56 million years ago, Antarctica and South America had pulled away from each other. Then, by about 40 million years ago, Antarctica and Australia had become separated by an emerging seaway. This expanse of water, which still exists today, is sometimes called the Tasmanian Gateway. And at some point, another seaway formed, the Drake Passage, off the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula sometime between 36 and 23 million years ago. 
So as time wore on, Antarctica went from being a land bridge between South America and Australia to being an isolated continent. The stage was set for a dominant new force in the Southern Ocean, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, or ACC. This current still swirls around Antarctica, and hands down, it's the most powerful current on Earth. Its volume is a thousand times bigger than the Amazon River, and it chugs along at the breakneck speed of 40 centimeters per second in some locations. Propelled by winds and unimpeded by land, the swirling current blocks warmer waters farther north, keeping them away from the mainland. It also dredges cold water from the ocean floor to the surface. And those two factors work together, creating a chilling effect on Antarctica. Climatologists think that the ACC is between 41 and 23 million years old, but there's not a lot of agreement about how the formation of this current actually affected the drop in temperatures and the rise in glaciation on ancient Antarctica. What we do know is that the late Eocene and the early Oligocene was a time of global cooling. At high latitudes in both hemispheres, temperatures dropped by about 15 degrees Celsius. Around the world, atmospheric carbon dioxide was decreasing, possibly because large quantities of it were being absorbed by marine plankton or buried in ocean floor sediments. This may have contributed to the worldwide cooling trend, and the formation of the ACC could have forced temperatures in Antarctica to drop even further. Regardless, we know that from about 36.5 million years onward, glaciers became more widespread across the continent. As ice blanketed Antarctica's surface, many plant communities suffered. A study of plant fossils from the Antarctic Peninsula found that its plant diversity dropped by 47% between the late Paleocene and Middle Eocene. Slowly warmth-loving trees and ferns found themselves replaced by temperate forests. These were dominated by southern beech trees, which we know had been living on the continent since the late Cretaceous period, based on fossilized leaf impressions and sporomorphs. And even their days were numbered. Their sporomorphs tell us that there were southern beech trees on Antarctica as recently as 2.5 million years ago. But today, it's a treeless continent, a polar desert whose remaining plants mostly consists of hardy mosses, grasses, lichens, and algae. Clearly, Antarctica's biodiversity took a hit after the Eocene, and yet life continued to flourish on its two former neighbors. After they split with Antarctica, South America and Australia were both totally isolated from the rest of the world for millions of years. And those two continents had something special in common, marsupials. New World possums originated in South America before some of them migrated north to Central and North America. Meanwhile, Australia is world famous for its charismatic marsupials, including the kangaroo, wallaby, and the now extinct thylacine. And DNA evidence suggests that the common ancestor of today's marsupials lived in South America about 70 to 80 million years ago. So from there, marsupials spread through Antarctica and into Australia back when those three continents were still connected. And as evidence of this journey, they left behind the remains of marsupials like Antarctodolops, relatives of the mammals that Australia is famous for today. So even though Antarctica has lost its big land animals, it was once a forested pathway for life. Which is why, even today, our world retains the ecological fingerprints of a time when Antarctica was green. PBS did so that gives you a little bit of uh, background on when Antarctica used to be green. And so now when you see the possum in your backyard, you can think that it actually originated from what is Antarctica today, migrated into South America, and then eventually made its way up into, uh, into North America. There's a couple other things that come up in the video that I'll talk a little bit more about as we uh, go on here, especially with the current and the, the infamous Drake Passage. So the last piece that I'll talk about with the exploration that really closed out the exploration period about 100 years ago is probably the most famous of all of the explorations, and that is um, with Ernest Shackleton. And so in uh, 1914, as we are uh, getting there into World War I, or I should say Europe is getting into World War I, we're not in World War I yet, um, Shackleton um, by the British Geographic Society is uh, basically given the money and the goal of we've made it to the South Pole, but no one has yet crossed the entire continent. So it was his goal to make it across to the South Pole and then all the way across the continent. This is Shackleton uh, in the middle here, along with several of his crewmates. So as you can see, it didn't work out so well. Uh, and so 
Shackleton runs into the same problem that many others uh, ran into, is that they got to a certain point, and I'll show you the map here where they made it to, and then they got crushed by the ice. And so for a little while, they stayed on the ship because their goal was, okay, we'll winter on the ship, okay, and then it will thaw out in the spring, and then we can, can move forward. Uh, they didn't make it very long. Uh, a couple months at max on the ship before literally the ice just cra crushed the ship. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, they were haunted by it because they could just hear the crushing of the ice against the hull of the, the ship as it continued to crush it. So these, there was a photographer on board. Uh, one of the things that was saved after the whole thing were all the glass, uh, I don't know how photography worked, but literally like the gr glass originals that the photos were on were saved. Um, and so these are two of the, the things that you saw. Uh, basically, these both of these pictures were taken of the endurance um, when they were leaving the ship finally, because they decided like, obviously we can't stay here, the ship is gonna sink. Um, and so they took their dogs and they took some of the smaller boats that they had and started dragging them across the ice. So um, basically it gets trapped and is crushed and sinks into the Weddell Sea, okay? Um, and their journey is amazing. How any human being survived this and had the the wherewithal and the ability and just the gumption to continue to go is just beyond me when you read about their, their journey. Um, you know, they were pulling these thousands of pounds boats with all of their gear and food and then the dogs, et cetera. Um, and so they ended up making it for a little way and then are able to drift on ice flows. So not in boats, but literally on basically large icebergs are able to drift for a little while and then um, they make it to uh, part of the peninsula. And then finally, um, Shackleton and three others get in one of the boats and basically just pray to God that um, we're gonna go out to boats and hope the current takes us uh, to South America. And after several months at seas and freezing temperatures, basically got to the point they didn't have any food left, et cetera. They finally um, landed on um, South Georgia but their journey got worse there. Um, so they landed on the uninhabited side of South Georgia. So they then had to climb huge hundreds of feet cliffs and then get down the other side of the mountain to, to get there. But by the grace of God, they did uh, make it there. So this kind of shows their, their path, okay? So this is them coming in, okay? And the ice pack was here, which today the ice pack is definitely not there anymore, okay? They made it all the way down and then see how close they got to the mainland, okay? They were very close to the mainland when in 1915, the endurance was trapped. But then the endurance, and while they were still on the ship, kind of floated with the ice pack. And then finally, it's crushed here off the peninsula. That's where it ends up sinking. We didn't know its location of where it sank until just a couple years ago. It's been in the last 10 years that they finally found where the endurance is, and they have pictures of it. It's well-preserved because the water is so cold. So then from there, um, that's when their crew took those lifeboats, the dogs, et cetera, and then they make it all the way here to Elephant Island, okay? Basically through a combination of using the boats and then uh, pulling all of that on the, the ice. So then basically all the crew stays there while he and three others just, like I said, hope to ride the currents on the roughest ocean in the entire world and they make it to South Georgia. But then there are several more weeks, like I said, before they finally reach civilization there. Um, check out this book, okay? I checked, it's there in the library. It's one of the most interesting books that I've ever read. It's just called Endurance, um, and it's about the journey. Um, and it's just one of those things, it's hard to put down. I mean, I'm a reader anyways, I really enjoy reading, but it's one of those books where you're just like, I cannot believe that people kept going on. I just would have been like, please God, just kill me, okay? I'm done, I'm not eating seal anymore, I'm not freezing anymore. It just is it's a terrible journey. Uh, um, it, it, on the, the boat that they were trying to get to when they were sailing from Elephant Island to South Georgia, it was so cold that um, when they breathed, it automatically froze their beards. Like that air, that mist literally to, turned to ice uh, immediately. That's how cold it, it was in the, the process. So Shackleton's nuts because he then, you know, they are saved and they go back to Great Britain and he tries it again. Um, not successful again, but it wasn't near as tragic 
uh, as, uh, as that time. And then he dies not, not long after that. So um, one of the things that is probably in a world today where we're used to, you know, so much war and famine and, and everything else, probably one of the great things in world history to ever occurred was the Antarctic Treaty. Um, part of that was brought about by um, Dwight Eisenhower's administration. But in uh, 1959, just prior to him leaving office, um, 12 countries signed the Antarctic Treaty. And it's still in place to, the, to this day. And it basically does a couple things. And you can see on the infographic over here. Number one, no one is allowed to um, claim land in Antarctica. It's there for the uh, good of humankind and for scientific study. There's no military allowed. There's no um, nuclear weapons testing or anything like that that's allowed. Anybody that establishes a scientific base there has to agree to share their research with all the other countries that are participating, uh, et cetera. And there's also for people that are going to Antarctica, like myself when I was there, there's all sorts of protocols that you have to follow. Um, and how many people can go on land at a certain time, you actually have to book that, the, whoever you're sailing with has to book all of that ahead of time in order for you to, to do that. So that is still in uh, place today, and as a result, it's probably the most peaceful place on the, the planet. So here is a map of today of Antarctica and of all of the bases across the Antarctic continent. Um, the United States, our two biggest stations are right at the South Pole at uh, Edmondson Scott Base because they were the two that, uh, that found the South Pole first. And then McMurdo, which is on the Australian side because Australia is this way. Um, McMurdo is the other big U.S. station. But you can see many other countries have bases around Antarctica. So let's talk about my uh, journey. So um, this map's a little bit hard to see. So it was basically um, the flying portion of my journey was a, a two-day journey. Um, I flew from Baltimore to Miami, and that was about a three-hour trip. And then it was an overnight from Miami to Buenos Aires in Argentina. That was nine hours of flight. Um, we stopped there for a day, I think we were maybe a day or two, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, and just kind of did some sightseeing in Buenos Aires, and then boarded a flight from ben, uh, Buenos Aires to Ushuaia, which is the most southern, southern city in the world, and that was another four-hour flight. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time in the air, but that's not the only time, because then uh, to get to Antarctica, I boarded my ship in uh, Ushuaia, and then it was another three days crossing the Drake Passage. Um, and we actually had a faster ship, which, so it was a, generally it's a four to five day journey um, to get across. And I'll talk more about the Drake Passage. This was a picture, a screenshot I took on my phone on maps, because um, you know your iPhone, it shows you like your current location. I just thought it was really cool, like it showed me so far down um, in the globe of, you know, and it also is cool to see how the globe is, is shaped as well too, and uh, et cetera. So we went in uh, January, 2023. I spent most of the month of January there in Antarctica. Why January? Right, okay, so opposite hemisphere. Remember when it's summer here, it's winter there, and when it's winter there, it's summer there. So I was thinking about, I'd never really thought about it a ton before, and I was like, it would be weird. Like, we're used to Christmas and, you know, snow and all that. And in South America, that is not the case. You know, it's warm. Yeah, in Australia, et cetera. So, yeah, we were there um, in the summertime. Summer in Antarctica generally runs from uh, November until February. But you don't want to play too long in February because you're starting to get to that point where you can start to have some really bad winter storms. And you definitely don't want to be there in March. Um, there are scientists that overwinter uh, there. Most of the stations either shut down for the winter or go to a skeleton crew. So even our U.S. stations like at McMurdo and there at the South Pole, they basically go to a skeleton crew for the, the winter. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is because of your being so far in the south of the globe, the same as if you're so far north in the globe, in the summertime, it's basically light 24 hours a day. So basically, for when I was there, it was like 23 point so many hours of the day it was light. Um, in the wintertime, it's dark for months. So like I struggle in our wintertime when, you know, here it starts to get like now where it's dark by the time I come home and when I go to work in the morning. 
um, imagine it being 24 hours of, of dark. And so um, a lot of people will leave the continent, you know, the scientists, et cetera, will leave the continent in the wintertime just because they know they'll go crazy. Um, the other thing is that satellites don't reach uh, as well in the wintertime for whatever reason. So they don't often have or they go days or weeks without any kind of communication with the rest of the world, et cetera. And so you better be ready to entertain yourself. Uh, and you can't really go outside for any long period of time because it's so cold. So um, temperature in terms of when I was there in the summertime, most of the time it was in the 30s, uh, high in the 40s. Uh, and I'll come back to that because of some of the weather changes that are occurring. Uh, the lowest it probably got was in the low 20s, uh, but of course the winds are very high. And so there were days that the winds were 80 miles per hour. And so it's much, much colder when that's occurring. So why January, like I said, uh, and this is another picture I took. This picture was at 1230 at night because that's when sunset was happening. That's about as far as, far as the sun goes down. And then about 15 minutes later, it comes right back up. Okay. Um, I'm someone that enjoys light. Like I, I would be perfectly fine if we slept during the daylight and I had light coming to my room. Like I love light. And so that doesn't bug me at all. Um, and so I just kept our little porthole on the ship open. Um, cause I, I liked it. So that's why it's called the land of the midnight sun. It's similar. They call Alaska that, you know, uh, during the, uh, summertime as well too. So this is our actual, um, path of the ship. So I was on the National Geographic Explorer ship was the name of it. Uh, and so basically we spent time around the Antarctic Peninsula, which is really, um, People that are tourists that go to Antarctica, that's really the only places that you can go. Because to go any further south, even in the summertime, you're going to need an icebreaker ship to get there. And so, or you're going to fly in, like on a, a military plane, et cetera. And so um, we spent time on the Western Peninsula and on the uh, Eastern Peninsula. And it's very interesting because it is very similar to here, okay? Um, so if you think about our weather, um, so often we get the rain, like Garrett County will get the rain, but then when it hits the Alleghenies, like they're on the border between Allegheny and Garrett County, like all of a sudden that rain goes away and it picks up again by about the time it gets to Washington County. So it's dry on the eastern side and wet on the western side. And there's a scientific reason for that, and I can't remember it. Like I said, I'm not a scientist. Um, but the same thing happens in Antarctica. So it's very dry on this side, and you'll see pictures here in a second, and very wet and frozen and kind of tundra on the, or excuse me, the opposite side. It's wet, frozen, tundra on the uh, western side, and then dry on the eastern side. The other thing that was different is a lot of these places, especially here, um, were places that like the captain of the ship was telling me that five years ago they never could have gotten to. Um, but the ice in that area has all melted at this point and now you can get to places that five years ago, like I said, you couldn't. So beyond scientists, um, you can get there as a tourist. Um, the, the thing about it is that you can get cruises out of Ushuaia. Um, there are a couple different uh, companies that do them, but they are very, very, very expensive. There were paying passengers on uh, our ship. Our ship only had about 100 people altogether on the ship. So there may have been about 50 people that were paying passengers on the ship. And the cost of their ticket was like somewhere just over $20,000 a person. Um, so they were well-placed persons in society. <laughs> uh, very different from me. <laughs> um, and mostly, um, my there was nobody really young on the cruise, uh, not like paying passengers. Most of them were older folks who either they did have a lot of means or this is something that they and their partner had been saving up their entire life to do. And they were doing like a retirement trip or something like uh, that. But most of the cruises and things like that that you're going to see to Antarctica are pretty, pretty pricey. Uh, and that was the nice thing about me being selected for it because I didn't pay anything. Everything was, even my flights, all that was completely paid for. So that was very, very, very nice because otherwise I probably would never have made it to uh, Antarctica at any point. This is our ship. Um, this is the National Geographic Explorer. The National Geographic and Lindblad have two ships that sail to Antarctica, the um, Explorer and then the Endurance are the two ships that they use. The Explorer is a little bit older. Um, 
but in the um, what's our winter time, they uh, are moved to other parts of the, the world. They do some European uh, things as well, too. So the difference between a National Geographic ship and like a you know a cruise ship or something like that, um, there are a couple things. So these, they don't call them cruises. They call them expeditions because the, the time is very scientific focused. So a, a large contingent of the crew are scientists that are on board, people that have the distinction of being selected as a, like a National Geographic Explorer. And so they are doing experiments, et cetera. They let you participate in that if you want to participate in that. They do presentations throughout the day that you can go and you can learn uh, more about their research, et cetera. We had a, a couple people on board that had actually overwintered in Antarctica at different points, so they shared about that. Um, and so really, it's very scientific um, focus. So you're spending your time there looking at Antarctica from a scientific uh, kind of background and not just a, you know, oh, it's beautiful. I mean, which certainly it, it is. So I'll give you a quick tour of what the inside of the ship looked like. This is the main, uh, main meeting area. And so this is where they would give their presentations from. Um, generally, they would stand in the center and there's TVs all around the room. And then, you know, you could sit and that's where all, we'd have a couple, usually like three presentations a day on different science topics, et cetera. Uh, they, we were really lucky because we also had a National Geographic photographer on board. So the very first day as we were crossing the Drake Passage, she actually gave us um, uh, about a two hour class on how to use your phone as a really good camera because the iPhones especially have gotten so good at uh, photography, so like using your settings and all that because you didn't really need a really fancy camera in order to get some really good pictures. So, and then she would help you, you know, throughout the, the trip to help you get good pictures, which is some of the reason why some of my pictures are good because I'm not a photographer by any sense of the, the means. This is the very top of the ship. They have a library. Uh, it's all focused on the places that it sails. And then it's all a quiet space. It's really nice because on both sides you can see out, you know, the, the ship. And so a lot of times I would just go up there to read or to take some pictures, et cetera, because you get some really good uh, views from that point. Um, two different rooms here. This is the very front of the ship, right under the uh, bridge. This is the chart room. So it would, they would update, the crew would update where the ship was on the maps every day. And then you could see out the front. And then this is just the, the dining area. Uh, I didn't include any food pictures in the, the uh, presentation, but we ate very, very good, uh, which made me very happy, as you can see. You know, I'm not turning down a meal anytime soon. So, so let's talk about the Drake Passage. Uh, this is the part that scared me the most. So, A, I'd never been on a cruise before. Uh, I'd only ever been on the ocean one time. Uh, when I was in middle school, Dad and I did a scouting thing in the Florida Keys, and we um, went out on a boat sea fishing. And I wasn't really a big fan. I didn't get sick, um, but like huge swells, all that. It wasn't really a big deal. So A, cruising has always made me nervous um, being on the ocean. But then um, as I started to read about the Drake Passage and found out that it is the roughest ocean in the world um, and uh, all of that, I started to get scared. And then two weeks prior to when I went, you may remember this because it was on like CNN and all the big uh, news outlets. There was a, a Viking cruise there in the area where um, the Drake Passage was so rough that someone actually ended up dying on the, the ship um, because of things getting flung around, et cetera. So the Drake Passage is known by two names, either the Drake Shake or the Drake Lake. And so I spent about the month beforehand praying to God, like, please make it the Drake Lake uh, on the way over. So let's talk about why it's the roughest ocean in the world. So they started talking about this in the video there a second ago, but the Antarctic current is not impeded by anything. So it literally continues to circle the continent and continues to circle the continent, and there's nothing stopping it. Like our continents, for example, like the Atlantic Ocean is stopped by North and South America and by Africa and Europe. Um, the Pacific, you know, et cetera. There's nothing stopping this current. So that's part of it. The other part of it is the winds are so strong. 
Um, you know, we're talking about a hurricane right now in Florida that's got winds of 180 miles per hour. You can get 200 plus mile per hour winds as the, the closer you get to the South Pole. And again, there's not a ton impeding that. You have the a mountain range that runs through the peninsula to here, which is actually just an extension of the Andes from when it used to be connected. Um, but otherwise, it's not a super mountainous continent. So that's also plays a, a role. The final thing that plays a role is that here specifically, you have warm Atlantic and warm Pacific waters coming in, mixing with the cold Antarctic waters, and it makes a very rough current. So as a result, um, if you get any kind of storms whatsoever, it's going to be a, a rough trip. So going over, great, it was the Drake Lake. Coming back, not so much. Uh, it was the Drake Shake. Uh, the whole coming back experience was terrible for, for me. Um, we had a COVID outbreak on the ship. Uh, and on the last day on land there, I got sick uh, and did not, I did not go to the doctor on board because I knew if I did, I would be held in Argentina for 20 days afterwards and quarantine. I was like, I'm not being held in Argentina for 20 days. So I just kept to myself uh, and was miserable in my room, but it was also very, very, very rough. Um, Sometimes you were just being up and down like this, and sometimes you were side to side like this. And all I can tell you is I would be in my bed, and I just knew, because all of a sudden you'd feel yourself going up, and then it just kind of stopped, and then the whole front of the ship would go boom, down. Uh, and then sometimes just be side to side. So I did not get seasick. I actually, this is weird, because I'm not like a roller coaster person or anything like that. I hate that type of ride. I found it kind of soothing um, in bed, et cetera. Um, but all across the ship, like, uh, you know, on the walls and stuff, there are ropes. And that's basically the only time or the only way you can get around is like you're holding on to ropes. And there's lots of senior citizens on the boat with me. And I'm just like closing my eyes because, you know, I'm a paramedic. And I'm like, please, God, do not let someone break their hip because I'm just seeing these people like falling over, et cetera. Basically, it, it was like watching a bunch of drunks walk around um, because you cannot walk straight. The worst part was stairs. I hated the stairs. And of course, there's an elevator on the ship, and I'm just like, I'm not getting in an elevator when we are going like this and, and that, OK? It's one thing to be stuck in an elevator on land. It's another thing to be stuck on an elevator uh, in the, the ship like that. So yeah, you just kind of had to hold on for dear life. Uh, everything in your cabins had to be secured down. Like, you can't leave um, luggage and things like that out. Every, there's cabinets and everything. You have to put everything away because otherwise it's just a flying object that's going to come at you at some point. So um, I pull a couple videos here. This was the Drake uh, shake on the way back here. I kind of meshed some of my cell phone videos together to give you an idea what it was like on the way back. It doesn't have any sound or anything like that. That's that part where I was like, boom. <laughs> And the other thing I kept thinking is like, okay, I'm on a very modern ship that actually has, I don't know what it is, but there are things built into those ships that actually make it less rocky. And I'm thinking the people that were on wooden ships 100 years ago that were using sails, et cetera, God bless them. I just can't even, I can't even imagine like having to sail that way. Okay, and so um, the next thing I'll show you here is what's called the Antarctic Convergence. So that's when you hit the line of uh, 60 degrees, and you know that you've hit the Antarctic con Convergence, meaning you're in Antarctic water, because all of a sudden, it's like going up Backbone Mountain, and it's very foggy, where you just can't see in front of you. Because all of a sudden, everything just is gone. It's all fog, you can't see, but a couple feet in front of the ship. And it's because that's when the warm waters of the Atlantic and Pacific hit the cold waters of the Antarctic. And so you get this fog that appears all, all of a sudden, and you know that you're in Antarctica. So I think one of these is a video, yeah. We're coming into the Antarctic circle, which you know because the Antarctic Water temperature change that happens at 60 degrees, latitude, simply enter the Antarctic. So right now, 
I always like you'll never see a video of me like right on the edge because I'm a I'm scared of heights, but B I was like it would be my luck that I'll just go overboard and yeah then I mean you die pretty quick, but even still you know I think this other one's a video yeah the other one's a video too. So the scenes are definitely getting rougher. Seems to be really softening now. Yeah, uh, I'm outside. Antarctic waters. So yeah, uh, you, those are good pictures too, just kind of showing you like how rough the, the water is. All I can think is like, you know, it's like you're a little kid playing with a toy in a bathtub and it's just like moving around because that's kind of like what you felt like. Okay, so um, this is the first landscape that I saw and I thought, are we actually in Antarctica or should they like lie to us? <laughs> we went somewhere else. Um, when I saw this, I was like, this really looks like the surface of Mars. And it was interesting because the one of the scientists were with us, he's like, it's funny you should say that because NASA will do a lot of their like rover training and stuff here because the surface is very similar to like our lunar surface and to our um, to the Martian surface, et cetera. So it's very dry and rocky uh, on the uh, on some of the, the sides there of the peninsula. This is just a little stream that was coming down. Um, I had to do it because I was like, you know, I'm in Antarctica. The water can't be any fresher in the world. So I drank out of the stream. I'm still alive. So uh, but it's probably the freshest tasting water uh, that I've ever tasted in my, my life. Um, but, you know, it's one of those places like a camera just doesn't do it justice. And I'm, I'm using a good camera, but um, I just the colors are so vibrant. Uh, the best, you know, comparison I could make is it reminded me, this part specifically reminded me a lot of the Grand Canyon, just probably not as bright red as what the Grand Canyon is if you've been to the Grand Canyon before. Um, but yeah, very, reminded me very much of that. So then this is the next uh, place that we came. Here, it's very green. And this really reminded me more of Ireland, if you've been to Ireland before, because Ireland is super green, lots of different gr colors of green, et cetera. Um, but one of the things they told us, and was 100% the true, is they told us coming in that you'll know when we're close to Antarctica because you will smell Antarctica miles before we ever get to it. Uh, anyone want to guess why? Penguins, okay? Penguins, okay? This is all penguins, okay? There's thousands, all these little dots you're seeing everywhere, these are all penguins everywhere. And about six miles out, you could start to smell them. Um, uh, there, you know, birds are smelly animals. Um, if you've ever been to a zoo before, like the flamingo exhibit, that's what it smells like, okay? And so you can smell them. The other thing is, um, I have better pictures, I'll show you this, and it's hard to see in this, but at first I thought, when I was looking out, I thought I was seeing like flying fish, and I was like, I didn't know there were flying fish in Antarctic waters, but it wasn't. It was the penguins swimming back to land, and they porpoise up and out of the, the water as they're going back towards the, the land. Oh yeah, we'll get to that part. Yeah, it does snow, yep. And in the winter time, this area would be covered uh, in snow, yep. Um, this is just more of that, that land there. And then now we get to the, to the snowy side, okay? Um, this we, uh, they told us, they were different like when we landed at different places. Um, a lot of times they led different hikes, et cetera. And so they said that like it was optional if people wanted to do this hike, we could go to the kind of summit of this mountain um, and see this glacier here in the side and really get a good, good picture of it. And kind of like Ireland's the land of greens, Antarctica is the land of whites and blues. And it's just, 
This looks beautiful, but it's even more beautiful with your, your own eyes. So anyways, my stupid self was like, yeah, I'll do the hike. Because they, they would tell you like, oh, it's just like easy, medium, hard, or uh, very hard. And they told us this one was just like uh, an easy to a medium. I'm like, okay, that'll be fine. Uh, I was the last to get to the peak, dying. I'm thinking, you know, if you die here, you're not getting back to land. There is no hope. Like out of breath, et cetera. But it was definitely worth to seeing to get up there, to see the, uh, the glaciers, to see the icebergs that had freshly uh, broken off the, the glaciers, et cetera. So when we went out exploring, we would always have to gear up. Um, they provided us with a coat. It's a three-layer coat, uh, and then you can kind of remove it. I still have my coat today, um, but it's just like a very heavy winter coat. So then um, it was also three layers of pants that you would wear. So they recommended like you wore long underwear, then a regular pair of um, insulated pants on top of that, not jeans, because you know if your jeans get wet and then it's cold, it's gonna be really rough. And then on outside of that, you would wear waterproof pants, which is what's there in the, the corner. Um, of course, I would always take my uh, camera out with me. It's not so cold where I was at that you had to worry anything with that, plus it's a digital camera. Always gloves. You always, always, always want to have sunglasses on um, because the ultraviolet light is uh, especially um, rough there. And also because all the white, it just the light reflects off of it, and so it's kind of blinding. So I had goggles that were um, polarized that I used. And then you always wear sunscreen. Antarctica, you will burn faster than anywhere else in the world. Part of it is because the hole in the ozone layer is right above uh, Antarctica. And the other part of it is, is because the UV light is so high there. And so it seems weird because it's cold outside and you see it's snowing and you're there like lathering sun, uh, suntan lotion all, all, all over you. And then I'd always, of course, have my water bottle. And then this was uh, a little sleeve I could put my cell phone down into to take pictures, et cetera, with my phone if I wanted to take anything with my phone or videos, et cetera. To get to, get to land, we use Zodiacs. Um, the same, same types of boats that the Marines use uh, are what we reuse. They're kind of like super uh, rubber rafts is basically what they are. And so we would get to land that way. And I took a video of this because it was usually pretty rough getting on land and you're just kind of like holding on to dear life on the side. But I'll show you this video of us going in to land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of stop and slow because you don't want the prop to hit the ice because then you really are up the creek without a paddle. There, you could do a polar plunge. This guy did not. Yeah. I have a career because there are stupid people that do stupid things, and then they get to see me on the ambulance. I'm not one of those people. So, no, I did not polar plunge. No. Uh -uh. Oh, yeah, like people made, like, snow angels and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Um, it was interesting because when specifically when we got this far south and started having all that ice, I'll never forget waking up the one morning and just hearing the ice scrape on the side of the halls. Um, and it's just one of those things I was like, this is what the people on the Titanic heard too. Uh, and, but at the same time, like, you know, this is like a ship that's built for this, et cetera. Just very eerie at first um, when you first see all that ice and you're going through it. So this is my, uh, the other teachers with me, Kip, he's from Colorado, like I said, he works for National Geographic. So the one day um, we could sea kayak around um, one of the areas that we had stopped at. So we got out into the sea kayak um, and uh, these are some pictures that I took. I think there's one more slide after this that has another picture uh, from the sea kayaking. But one of the most amazing things happened while we were doing this. Um, so we're, we're going around sea kayaking and I said to Kip, I said, I swear I just heard something. Um, and then all of a sudden you could hear a, wh a whale, um, you, you know, do the sound that whales do. And then the next thing you know, not even 10 feet away from us, a humpback whale just kind of pops up and goes back down. And just kind of, they're very playful. Um, I hope they're very playful because they're a lot bigger than I am. Um, and so Kip was like, he's much more adventurous than I am. I am not super adventurous. And so 
He's like all excited. He's like, let's go closer. And I'm like, no, let's go to the ship because I'm not getting accidentally plumped into the, to the water. Um, unfortunately, I was not quick enough in order to get a picture of that time of the whale. I'll have some other whale pictures I'll show you here in a couple of minutes. Um, but I was not able to there at that point to do that. So as we were coming back to the ship, um, the crew um, met us in another little uh, Zodiac. Uh, and they had this sign up that said hot chocolate, and they were dressed like Vikings, et cetera. And so literally as we're getting on the ship, they were like making hot chocolates uh, for us, which was good because it was freezing cold uh, outside. And you could see like a, a, a rainstorm had come in too, so it was also misting. Uh, so we were very, very cold going back to the, to the ship. But yeah, no, so it, it very felt, met, felt very much like winter here. Yeah, I never felt like, honestly, I've had colder temperatures here. Yeah. So one of the things that's happening um, is their winters are getting much warmer. Just like we are seeing our summers get warmer, our winters are getting milder uh, here. Um, we're seeing that, but to an even greater degree in Antarctica. So um, I was going to talk about this with the penguins, but I'll just share it now. So um, we're seeing mass death of penguins, uh, of penguin colonies, just even in the last 10 years. And so one of the scientists that on board with us was actually from Australia, and that's what she does is just studies penguins. Um, and so we were talking about some of the different things. Part of it is a habitat that's disappearing because the ice is, is melting, et cetera. But the other thing I never thought, because like I was just not, I never expected to have rain in Antarctica. I just expected snow. Um, and like the captain was saying, 20 years ago, you would not have experienced rain like you're experiencing now. It would have been snow or sleet or something like that. So part of what's causing the mass death of the penguins is they're being rained on for multiple days on end. And that rain gets down into their down fur, which gives them their coat to stay warm. Uh, and then when it gets cold, it refreezes and their down does not protect them then. And so they freeze to death uh, as a result. So that's part of what's occurring with the, the climate change. I always tell people, like, you know, I understand um, climate change and some of the things that I've seen here just in my lifetime. But in terms of seeing, like, real climate change happening right in front of my face, Antarctica was the place that I, I've seen it um, more than any other place that I've ever seen in the, in the world. So I'll show you some of the pictures of um, icebergs. This is about the closest you can ever get to an iceberg because icebergs um, are very, um, they're just unexpected. They can very quickly change sides and all of a sudden you're under underwater with icebergs. And generally you're only seeing a very small part of the iceberg above. The What's underneath the ocean is generally much, much, much larger. And you could just see so much of the blues and the whites, et cetera, as you can kind of see from the, the picture here. So one, this is a, one of the facts that I learned from one of the scientists that I was there with. So the reason that it has that deep blue color uh, is not because of the reflection of the sky, because I was thinking, oh, well, that's why the ocean is blue, because it reflects off of the sky. Um, but it is because um, that snow that has made the iceberg has compacted and compacted and compacted and frozen over thousands of years, and it doesn't have any air in it anymore. And as a result of it not having air in it, it gets that really, um, or it really reflects the blue in the, the sky. And so that's why it, it's, it's that way, because you're seeing ice from thousands of, of years ago. This is just another good picture of some of the icebergs that we saw uh, as we were going. So this one here, I'll show you a close up in a second, um, but one of our scientists on board like said, you need to look out this iceberg. And I'm like looking and I'm not seeing anything as you guys are probably not seeing anything right now. But right here, anybody notice anything? There's a little emperor penguin that's just by himself or by herself uh, on the ice. So I can get a close up. That's a little closer. Um, that I could get. It was interesting. Um, the scientist was kind of um, surprised because it's further south than emperor penguins typically are. Um, and it's also a little bit odd to see them by themselves like that. So generally what has happened when you see them like this is they're on the ice because they're being um, chased by a pod of orcas or seals. And so that's probably what's happened at this point is that it's, it's there because it doesn't want to be in the water right now and become someone's dinner. This was just a really, another really pretty iceberg that we saw. 
that's that same harbor that I was showing you there a couple minutes ago that we were going through in the Kodiak. Yeah, these are um, some pictures of penguins that I got that were playing on icebergs. This is a different one than the one that you saw there a couple minutes ago. Yeah. This is another close up, yep, of the pictures. And you can see it's raining. You can see the raindrops on the water. I just got used to the rain. It rained a lot while I was there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Compacted layer. Yes. Can you see the distinct layers? Um, yes and no. You can see the distinct layering by the color of the color change that occurs. Yeah. So the the deeper blues are the oldest ice, and then it gets it gets out further and further towards the surface, becomes like a lighter blue, lighter blue, and then like your clear and snow and and such. So that's the best way to kind of tell the layers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, with the rocks. So like in the, the area that first that was really dry that I was like talking about, like, like Marge, yeah, you can definitely see the, the layering there. And there was a geologist on board and how you spend your life studying rocks is beyond me. But, you know, some people, are you geologists? I'm sorry. Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we have you. Uh, I could not do it. But yeah, so like they, he like got really down deep and dirty into it. And I was like, I don't understand anything you're saying right now. But yay, it's a colored rock. It's really pretty to me. And that's about the extent that I got out of it. So yeah. Yeah, so this one here, you'll see in a second because I was able to get this. So the penguin kept for a couple of minutes, kept looking over because I was trying to make the decision. Am I diving in or not diving in? Um, and so finally, as you've seen the next picture there, it goes in and I caught it while I was going into the water. This is another group. I like to lay and just play on the, the ice. OK, so I'm going to show you a quick video here before I go into some of my penguin pictures. It just shows uh, this one's not near as long as the, the last one. Kind of shows you some of the change that's occurring with the ice over the last couple years, and then specifically an event that occurred actually while I was there. Antarctica is so cold, its ice is up to two and a half miles thick and so vast and white that it cools the whole planet by reflecting sunlight. But scientists have warned it's now losing ice so fast it could flip from being the Earth's refrigerator to the Earth's radiator. It's midwinter in Antarctica and satellite images show in white here a little over five and a half million square miles of sea surrounding the continent have frozen over. But compare that to the red line, the long term average, and there is a gap right now with something like 900,000 square miles of missing sea ice. It's been at a record low all year. By the end of the Antarctic summer in March, it had shrunk back further than in previous years, and it's been falling further behind as the months go by. That's partly because of higher ocean temperatures, but also warmer air. This is one day last March. You can just about make out the edge of Antarctica, and those red colours show temperatures that were 38.5 degrees above normal, the planet's most extreme heat wave on record on its coldest continent. Why does this matter? Well, the melting ice on land is driving up global sea levels. Since the 1990s, they've risen by 1.8 centimetres because of melting ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. By the end of the century, the accelerating thaw would have added another 17 centimetres, putting an extra 16 million people around the world at risk of annual coastal flooding. If we don't get to net zero by mid-century, the sorts of things that we're starting to see in Antarctica now will probably play us into a huge significance for the future things that might happen in the future. So we're really concerned that what we're seeing now is the start of, of many worse um, uh, things that happen in Antarctica, and that'd be a tragedy both for the continent but for the rest of the planet. Antarctica has been shielded from global warming until recently by a strong vortex of winds spinning high in the atmosphere. But that doesn't seem to be enough to protect the ice anymore. Thomas Moore, Sky News. So one of the things, uh, and it showed there like the ice falling off of the glaciers and stuff, that was very, very common uh, throughout as I was there just constantly. And it just sounded like a roar of thunder as it just all of a sudden, boom, all, all the time. Um, we were never allowed to get close to any like places like this because you just never knew when the, the wall of ice was uh, going to come down. 
So this is the event that occurred while I was there. Um, literally a part of the continent, uh, a, part, a, sheet, a sheet of ice that was the size of London broke off uh, the continent and has thus gone into the, the ocean now at this point uh, and began to, to melt. Um, but that just is kind of showing you how quickly uh, this is occurring because of the, the warming temperatures that are, are being seen there. This is a satellite view. This is a satellite view. So that tells you how big this is. So this is being seen. This was actually taken from the International Space Station. Um, and so this is where the cut was. And then this part broke off. And this, so this is the before picture. And then this is the after picture as that finally came off. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about penguins. And I have lots of penguin pictures that I'll share with you. Okay. So penguins are birds, but they can't fly, um, even though they have wings. Um, the wings are more of a flipper, and so the purpose is to help them to swim very quickly in the, the water. Um, they swim at about 15 miles an hour. They're very, like I said, very, very quick, which they need to be, to, especially to escape predators. They live in colonies, as you see, and you'll see more pictures here, that numbers in the thousands. Uh, and they, the scientists monitor those colony numbers uh, from year to year as well, too. To stay warm, as well as to protect themselves from predators, they bunch up, um, which if you've ever seen the, oh gosh, it's probably been 20 years ago now, they came out that uh, penguin movie like March of the Penguins or something, where the emperor penguins are all huddled up, uh, and then they um, take turns with who's on the outside and move that person in, so basically to keep each other warm and no one freezes to death. Um, in terms of diet, they primarily eat fish, uh, they'll eat squid, and then krill, which are basically little microscopic uh, shrimp, and I'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. And then, of course, they're, they have the waterproof uh, feathers, et cetera, and then the down, but I told you, you know, what's happening as a result of that. Here are all the different penguin um, uh, breeds. These ones here, uh, the emperor, the Marconi, and then the king, uh, excuse me, macaroni, those are all um, further north. So those are in the South Falkland and uh, Georgia Islands, which I did not go to. So the penguins that I saw, that the ones that are actually in Antarctica and not on the islands are the Adeli, uh, the Gentoo, and the Chinstrap. So they're pretty easy to figure out, A, because of their size. Chinstraps are the smallest, but you know because they have a little black chin strap around them. Um, with the Adeli, I always knew it was an Adeli because they have a black head and then this prominent white eyeball um, there, whereas the Gentoo are a little bit taller, but they have some white on their head. So that's generally how I would know what is what type of penguin I'm looking at. So this is the porpoising like I was telling you about. You can see them jumping out of the water because they that's how they swim. They go down, up, and down, up, and down, up until they're diving to, to get food. And I have some videos of that that I'll show you. This is just me being closer, and you can kind of see them coming up out of the, the water as they're jumping. And then we start to head towards the colony. And I think, yeah, this is a video. And I was holding my nose with one finger while taking the picture with the, the other, or taking a video with the other. And you'll be able to hear them like squawking. And you can see them porpoising back to land, jumping in. And you can see the, some of the uh, seals, et cetera, that are on land with them. Um, some of the seals, are, they're not predators, uh, like Weddell seals, which are the most common ones where we saw. That's not really a predator penguin, so they don't really worry about it. This is another good video, same island, just showing you. Like they're, they're even up here in the cliffs. Like All those little dots are penguins up in the cliffs. Um, one of the things that you see in this, um, like you see a lot of this red, like on the rock. What is that? Yeah, it's penguin poop galore ev everywhere. Uh, it's all over the, the place. Yeah. 
So these uh, are one of the first places that we went to. This is on the dry side of Antarctica here. There are two videos I'll show you. Um, these are Adelie and Gentoo penguins here. Um, the closest we're allowed to get to them is 10 feet, and that's all part of that Antarctic Treaty. The problem is that uh, penguins do not see us as predators. Like, you, you know, when you go up to a wild animal here, most of them are going to run. Um, penguins don't because they don't see us as predators because um, the humans that are in Antarctica are there for scientific purposes and are observing them. So they don't have the same danger sense as what, uh, you know, mammals do and birds, et cetera, in other parts of the world. So that's just a little Adelie penguin. They're very cute to watch, you know, just waddle around. And I think these ones are gentoo, if I remember right. I gotta see them closer. So these balls of fluff that you're seeing, those are all babies, but it's towards the um, end of winter. So they're starting to look more like a penguin. Uh, you'll see some better pictures of that. Oh, they're the chin straps. You can see the little chin strap on them. These are some close-ups. Those are Adelis uh, that I'm seeing there. Um, and so uh, these ones were, that picture you saw of me at the beginning that's like on the flyer and stuff, it's right in front of uh, these. These guys are just like mucking it up in the mud. It just rained. More chin straps, yep. I don't think that, yeah. And this is uh, the back of what I just was showing you. This is kind of further back. And this is like what I was telling you, like those walls of ice. And I can remember as I was standing there, just like it just boom, would come down. And you would hear it before you'd see it because uh, about 10 seconds before it would actually fall, you'd start to hear this massive, like thunderous sound. Um, and then as soon as it comes down, just the seas just Ooh, wait, wait up with all the ice that ends up going in. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize that was a. Yes, uh, and I'm going to actually talk about that here in just a second with the parenting, but yes, for the most part. So I have some pictures of babies and things that I'll show you here, but I wanted to talk just briefly about this. This one is not my picture, but I wanted to see this because um, this part would be happening right now. Um, their eggs would be almost, they're towards the end of gestation right now. Those eggs will be hatching towards the end of this month, um, end of October. So um, most penguin species return to the same mate year after year. It's not the same with all, but most of their penguin species do that. The way they recognize their mate is through vocalizations. They have unique vocalizations when um, talking to, to each other. And then, um, which is why you just constantly hear this like chatter all over the place, okay? Um, so after they lay their egg or eggs, um, one parent, which is usually the male, will stay on land and keep the egg warm. Um, through the winter time because it's being incubated throughout the, the, hard, the hardest parts of the winter. And what they do is, depending on the penguin, um, they will balance it on their feet or like the emperor penguin kind of have like a little flap of skin at the bottom and it goes within that flap of skin. So then the mother will go out to sea for days on end, um, basically getting food and bringing it uh, back. So generally, um, they have an incubation period of about 65 days. And like I said, it's, her, it's occurring during the winter time. Um, the parents will feed their chicks regurgitated food. So all that food that they've eaten, they just regurgitate it right into the chick's mouth um, when they come back on sea. And so one of the things that they have is they have these what are called basically crutches. And um, it's basically like penguin daycare. Um, so what happens is a group of the small group of the families will get together and a couple of them will go and hunt and the others will watch the babies um, while they're they're gone. This is after they're hatched. Those are baby emperor penguins that you're seeing there. So um, this is one of the predators of penguins. I got this picture is one of the better pictures I got. That's a skua. Uh, it is a very, very large bird. I want to say skuas have a, a wingspan. It might be on here in a minute, but something around like 10 feet. Um, they're very large birds, and they 
basically come down and take the baby penguins, which are fairly large, and just take them away. And so this was a skua that was trying to come in, and you can see the parents of that little penguin daycare trying to swat at it away. Actually, I might have got a video of that. No, it wasn't a video. This one is probably the cutest video of the whole night. So you're going to see um, here are two baby uh, penguins. And then this is the mom who's uh, finished feeding them, but they are not finished being fed. They still want more food. So mom runs away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like an example of one of those little penguin daycares. And I have another video that's uh, of that specifically. And you'll see this one feeding its chicks. So this, like I said, this is towards the end of January. By February, they start going out to sea on their own, okay? So they don't stay in pairs or anything like that. It's basically every person or every penguin for themselves. So by the beginning of February, they'll have regular feathers like their parents do. They'll look like a, basically like an adult penguin, but then they go out to sea to, to feed. And it's very similar to like sea turtles. When sea turtles go out to sea, a lot of them do not survive um, that process. They're either preyed upon by seals or orcas are probably the best uh, example of, of predators for them, um, or just do not survive in, in terms of finding food, et cetera. But there's no more parenting after that. They don't return to their parents or anything of that nature. They just, they're off to their own lives. This is another good picture up close of the mom feeding its baby. So the other thing that penguins build are highways. Um, and these are their penguin highways. So to make it easier, um, what they'll do is they'll just keep smashing the same snow to the different places they're going to make, make a little highway system to get from one place uh, to another. This is one of my favorite pictures that I got of penguin going the highway. I was actually so distracted by taking this picture that one of the scientists was like yelling at me and I didn't hear it initially because I was standing in a highway and there was a penguin that was right here just like, please get out of the way, I'm trying to pass. And I had to, to step to the side and let the penguin uh, go by. That's another good one of the uh, penguins. Um, let me just see here what I can't remember what I have here. This morning in our Eye on Earth series, we explore how climate change threatens penguins in a oh, place yeah. few okay. people have visited. A new U.S. government report found the last decade was the hottest ever recorded on Earth. And 2019 was the second hottest year ever measured, raising new concerns about climate change. One of the places seriously affected Antarctica. Roxana Saberi went there to understand how penguins are being impacted by the warming temperatures. Good morning. Antarctica is one of the most remote places on the planet, but climate change is... This is one of the places that I was at and you saw pictures from. And this particular species of penguin, the chin strap. Elephant Island is so far flung Few people have set foot on these rocky shores. It took us three days of sailing with environmental activists from Greenpeace, crashing through waves and climbing across rubber rafts to join scientists counting penguins. Why count penguins? They come back to the same place to nest every year, which means we can really keep tabs on their population. So by observing penguins, we can get an idea of the health of this, this whole area. Alex Borowitz observes nesting areas like this, where one parent babysits while another travels down a penguin highway to fish for krill, then hikes back up to feed its chick the shrimp-like food. These scientists from Stony Brook and Northeastern Universities count each chaotic colony on foot with mechanical clickers and scan them from above with high-tech drones. All to see if this population of chinstrap penguins is dwindling, like elsewhere in the region. 
The researchers are traveling on Greenpeace ships from island to island across the Antarctic Peninsula. They're comparing different penguin populations to see how they're adapting to climate change here. It may not look like it, but this is one of the fastest warming areas on Earth. One nearby island is actually called Penguin Island. Over the past four decades, its chinstrap population has plunged by 75%. The numbers have dropped across the region as temperatures have soared by more than five degrees over 50 years. That's about five times the global average. So when you see climate change impacting things down here, glacial melt, uh, warming oceans, more acidic oceans, penguins do really interact with, with all of those things. So do krill, chinstrap's favorite food. They depend on sea ice to survive. The ice is really what brings all of the, the ocean life here together. So with less sea ice, there's less krill, so less food for the chinstrap penguin. That's the idea. After days of counting chinstraps on Elephant Island, 21, 22, 22, the scientists invited us onto their ship. 32 across. Watch them crunch numbers from one nesting site. Okay, so they've lost already 50% since the early teens. Wow. That's amazing. That fits the pattern they're seeing on the island so far. A decline of around 150,000 chin straps since the last winter survey 50 years ago. Another sign the researchers say this penguin population is collapsing across the region. It's very dramatic to have a wildlife population declining by 50% and unexploited wildlife populations. They're not hunted. And you think climate change is the main reason behind it? I think climate change is driving almost all of the processes down here now in a way that they've never experienced before. Penguins are a lot like people. They need food and a good environment to thrive. These researchers say if the world continues to warm, these birds can show us how other species, even human beings, will be affected by climate change. For CBS This Morning, Roxana Saberi, Elephant Island, Antarctica. Okay, next thing I'll uh, show you are some of the birds that I took. That's probably the best picture and probably the best picture of my entire life that I'll ever take. It was by like the grace of God that I just hit the shutter button at the right time. That's an albatross. Um, so albatross have a wingspan of about 11 and a half feet. They live for over 60 years. Um, so they have quite the long land, uh, lifespan. Uh, and they only return to land to breed. Otherwise, they are out in the ocean for their entirety of their, their lives. Um, and so they basically just circle Antarctica with the currents of the wind. Uh, and they just basically kind of continue to go around the continent and then feed off of uh, fish out of the ocean. That's the skua um, that I was telling you about earlier, just a different picture um, from a different side of it. And you can see how large they are and compared to the penguins. And uh, like I said, it's one of the biggest predators, especially of uh, baby penguins. Mm -hmm, yeah, that was a, a picture of mine too, yeah. Yeah, that one was easier to take just because they're so large and that fight went on for a good like five, 10 minutes uh, of me just standing there while it was, uh, before it finally left. This is actually a skua nest, um, or excuse me, an Arctic tern nest. And the only reason we knew it was a tern nest was because we were walking on this land and then all of a sudden we had two terns that were like dive bombing us and like screaming and everything else. And the, uh, one of the scientists that were with us, he studies birds. That's what his whole, all of his study is. And he's like, there's a nest around here somewhere. We need to get out of here. Um, and so we finally saw it. And it's really hard to see in there because it just blends in. But they build their nests right into the rocks. This is a snowy petrel. And the rule is if you see a snowy petrel, get out of the way right then. Um, because snowy petrels, their um, uh, defense mechanism is to throw up on you. Uh, and that's what you see on the one bird, uh, all that orange. They projectile vomit, and it's acidic. Uh, it won't kill you or anything like that, but it will definitely burn. Um, and so when you see a snowy petrel, uh, you get out of the way very quickly. Yep. Uh, last animal group, well, actually I have seals and whales, so the last two things that we'll, we'll look at. So a couple things about whales here before I show you a picture. So whales are the largest animal that have ever lived. Um, they're also among the most intelligent of animals that we know of. 
they have a very, very large brain, which makes sense when you just think about how uh, big they are. And just the, the limited studies that we've done on whales, we know that their neocortex is highly developed. So that's like their thought process, et cetera. Um, specifically with blue whales, which are the largest um, animals in the world, and I'll talk more about blue whales specifically in a second, there are scientists that think that they, uh, based on some of the behaviors they see, they see subcultures, uh, they see dialects and language with them, um, but there are some scientists that theorize that their brains are so developed that they have the capability of having religion uh, in their, their thought process, which is just kind of like mind blowing uh, when you think about it. So, like I said, they have different ways of communicating with one another. One of the things that they've just recently discovered in the last uh, couple years is that when you hear those whale calls, um, you think that a lot of times they're just calling to other whales in the area. Um, those whale calls can go for thousands of miles. And one of the behaviors that they have now observed whales multiple places around the world doing is these whales will find cliffs almost like uh, half hollow type cliffs uh, along continental belts. And they will specifically point at it and call into it because their call will echo off of it and go, they can hear thousands of miles away. So it's like a telephone almost that they use the natural geography of the earth to literally echo that further and further out to the ocean where they can be having conversations with other whales who are nowhere near uh, close. So this is just a map that shows you some of the whale superhighways of the world and how they migrate. So many whale species, especially blue whales, humpback whales, orcas, end up coming here to Antarctica in, during the Antarctic summer. The reason being is because the waters are full of krill, um, which they uh, really survive on and feed off of. And so you can see the humpback whales, that's all the orange are all kind of submerging on the Antarctic continent. Now, if you've ever been to Alaska and you've seen humpbacks there, those whales generally don't come all the way to Antarctica, although they have had trackers on some that do. Generally, they go out to like the areas of Hawaii, et cetera, during the summer or during the winters uh, to um, be in warm water during that time. So these are some different pictures that I took. I never had a whale that made a big porpoise out of the water. And the reason that is, is because generally the only time you see that is when they're mating uh, and trying to attract other whales. And so that was not mating season when I was there. So this is a humpback whale. This is its mouth coming up because this is exactly what they do. They come up and when they're coming up, they're taking all the krill that's in the water and feeding it through their uh, mouth. And then they'll blow the water out their uh, blowhole. This is just kind of it on its side there, kind of just like waving. These are some or an or a pod of orcas. So unlike humpbacks, uh, orcas almost always are in pods because that's how they hunt together. So orcas are also known as killer whales because they are one of the largest predators of the sea. They feed on seal and penguin primarily, but they will also uh, hunt uh, krill or eat krill uh, as well too. This is a humpback whale. That was one of the times we were out in a Zodiac. Same humpback whale, just a different, different view of it. So blue whales are really interesting um, because they're the, like I said, they're the largest whale or mammal on earth altogether. Um, so we, they, we were told by our crew that we were the, only the third expedition to ever see a blue whale because uh, they believe there's less than a thousand of them left on the planet now. Um, the really interesting thing uh, about whales is just how big they are. So babies, when they're first born, they gain 200 pounds every 24 hours. So don't feel so bad about your weight, okay? Um, and so they will weigh over 200 tons as an adult. Uh, they average about 105 feet long. No one can uh, yet figure out how old they get. We know that they live over 200 years. Uh, and the reason that we know that is because recently, uh, since the turn of the century, they found a uh, blue whale that had died that had uh, airheads in it, in its skin, that were from 
hundreds of years ago by the Inuit people uh, in uh, uh, Alaska. And so they worked with the Inuit people to identify them, et cetera, uh, and it was well over 200 years. So they have incredibly long lifespans as well, too. I'm going to skip over this video here because I want to wrap up with some stuff with the seals here. So seals and sea lions are the last of the type of animals that I uh, saw. So there's a bunch of different seal species. The Weddell is the most common. Um, there are leopard seals, there are crab eagle seals. Ross is probably the second most common and elephants are probably the third most common. Um, the Weddell seals uh, can dive very deep. Um, we know that they can dive to at least 2000 feet because we've observed them there. Um, but there's, it's another one of those areas, just like the whales, that we don't have a ton of uh, science on them yet. They can stay underwater for up to 90 minutes. They actually slow their heart rate down to conserve their need for oxygen, which is why they can stay, stay down. The leopard seals are the ones that are predators to penguins uh, and can become very nasty. Um, they'll eat penguins, they'll eat fish, they'll actually eat other seals uh, as well too, because they have very, very powerful jaws and very, very sharp teeth. Um, the elephant seal is the largest and it can weigh up to 8,000 pounds. So this is a fur seal um, that I caught from while I was out in one of the zodiacs, just kind of standing there on the land. Another, those are more fur seals. This is a leopard seal, um, just floating on its back in the ocean. This is a Waddell seal. Um, all seals in general, they want you to keep at least 20 to 30 feet away. Because um, you see seals as like these, you know, very large, you think lazy, um, laying on the ground. Um, but when they want, if you take them off, they can get up and they can move at you very, very quickly. There's actually been several um, tourists in Antarctica that have been killed because they go for the neck. So they come, they charge you very, very quickly and just go straight for your, your neck. Um, and so, yeah, I never got very close to seals, which is why you see all my pictures are basically like zoomed in on seals. Just another colony. So I have one last video I want to show you, and then I'll finish up and take any other questions. We're here for a three-week expedition to deploy some time-lapse cameras on the Antarctic Peninsula and on South Georgia. We've already told the powerful story of what's going on way up north. I've always wanted to tell the story of what's going on down here. Adding a story from this part of the world makes the archive that much more powerful. The peninsula is one of the fastest warming places in the world. The year-round temperatures at Palmer Station are up five degrees on average. Five degrees is an enormous increase in warming. That's a big story. And the glaciers give us a chance to bring that story to life. South Georgia is a stunning place. I was completely unprepared for how spectacular it would be. In the early 1800s, this place was a hub for sealing and whaling. In 1914, Sir Ernest Jacobin's expedition stopped here on its way to Antarctica. His photographer, Frank Hurley, shot some pictures that document where the glaciers were on the beach. 1972, Phil Stone comes down and he does a study of ice positions as well. Frank Hurley's photographs from the Shackleton trip are enormously valuable. The whalers took photographs, but they took photographs of the whaling stations and whaling activity. Hurley's pictures are probably the earliest we have 
of the general environment of South Georgia. The changes of South Georgia in the last century or so are really quite marked. As far as the Extreme Ice Survey is concerned, we thought our real work was in Antarctica. And when we got here, I realized that South Georgia was an incredible opportunity for both art and science. South Georgia and the Antarctic Peninsula down here in the air currents blowing around the southern part of the world. It's giving you a test for what's going on in these latitudes. And you can see the air and the climate changing through these glaciers. This one. That's the one that was taken over there. All the deflation that may have occurred and just throw off what we're actually looking at. But I think overall we're a little bit higher than what this photo was taken at. But good God, has that changed? In 1972, Retrobe Glacier was this great big tongue of ice looking down out of the highland, laying all the way across this area called Gold Harbor. We just got here, and there's no ice on the beach anywhere. So big changes have happened here. Our pictures, repeating what others have already done, makes an amazing long-term record of how this area has changed. We can follow the retreat of glaciers from satellites these days. They produce very precise numbers, but in many cases, there's simply no substitute for a striking visual image. But I think it carries power that raw numbers don't. I no longer know how long the Extreme Ice Survey is going to go on. I thought it would only be a three-year project. Now we're on year eight, and we're basically committed for five more years down here in the Southern Hemisphere. There's some connection between our minds, the camera's eyes, and what's going on in the landscape. There is some voice that comes through that process, it comes from the ice, through the camera, through our minds, and back out in our voices to the society around us were performing a service on behalf of the landscape. After a certain point, I am not even sure that it's my choice to make. It's just what is our humble task to do. So last thing, this is something else one of the scientists uh, shared with us, um, that if Antarctica lost sea, uh, if the Antarctic lost sea ice in 2023 and formed its own country, it would be the 10th largest country in the world um, with the amount of sea ice that was just lost in 2023 alone. So it's happening very, very, very quickly. So that's my journey. Some of the pictures I've had, I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Just don't make them too scientific. Unless you want to ask the geologist a question about rocks, I'm sure he can answer them for you. I can't. <laughs> Anything that I can answer for anyone that's already been asked? What personalities of people that were reported on Earth? Yeah, um, almost all were from either the United States or Great Britain. Yeah. Almost all, all of them were were there, um, and I don't I don't know what it's typically like on some of the other um, the ships that go to South or excuse me to Antarctica. So, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the answer to that story. Um, I can tell you that the mountains do get very high. They're higher than here. Um, just I can tell you that from just looking at them. Um, cause you know, if you think about the Andes are some of the highest mountains in the world and that's all an extension of the Andes mountain range, but I, I don't know what the exact, uh, mm -hmm. the height of those are. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. He's been to Antarctica. He might answer. Yeah. Yeah. Like, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, it's not a question. Huh? Uh, I kind of envy you of how, being able to go down on such a luxurious ship mm -hmm. because I was in Antarctica. Oh, yeah. But it was in 1964. Mm -hmm. 60, yeah, yeah, 1964, 65. Uh -huh. And uh, 
my ship was not such a lucky ship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was at uh, Murder Sound, and uh, we went down on a cargo ship. Okay. And yeah. the difference between where you went down and the direction mm -hmm. we went was mm -hmm. what they called ground swells right. of the ocean. And it was just like a, a glass mirror, a curved glass mirror, where you went up one side and down the other huh. for days on end. Yeah. And I've never been so sick in all my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And these, these ground swells would go up about 50 feet. Yeah. One side, down the other, mm -hmm. day after day. Yeah. Then at that time, sorry ladies, there were no women allowed in that <laughs> article. <laughs> and uh, at the uh, base in McMurdo Sound, the difference between then and today, uh, today they have all kinds of luxury things down there. They have restaurants like, you know, McDonald's and <laughs> things mm -hmm. like that, and, and very nice accommodations yeah. and so forth. Well, we had the Quonset Hut and a little heater in the middle of the Quonset Hut. Yeah. And um, the chapel was a Quonset Hut. Everything mm -hmm. was a little Quonset Hut. Yeah. So, yeah, McMurdo is a huge base. You're right. It's just like a little city now. Yeah. 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 Very small. yeah. Very small. In three years in McMurdo, there ain't no McDonald's there. No, well, not <laughs> when the, that's when when were you there? Eighty nine, ninety, ninety one. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they have them there now, but they sure yeah. didn't have any of that now. That's yeah. Sure. Yeah. Those quant 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 they're quant still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. oh yeah. Mm -hmm. The biggest on record, I'm not sure. There's a there was a, one of the other scientists that were on board was the guy that studies whales, um, and so he specifically studies like their calls, um, and like he can interpret like, oh, that's a da 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 da, or this is a da 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 based on their sounds and all that. But I don't know, and it, because specifically, there's not a ton of research on blue whales because there's so few of them left, and it's basically like trying to find a diamond. Um, yeah, it's just very very rare. So yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the girlfriend thought they were getting married when he graduated from college, but he decided he wanted to see the world. Mm -hmm. And so by age 30, he went to all the continents and some other oh. twice. Yeah. But he had incredible times, uh, some really scary. He was locked up in Nairobi, Kenya jail. Oh, yeah. With three nationals, and they weren't getting a call through. Yeah. One of the kids, Prabhuji, um, he just had some incredible times. Yeah. But I'll never forget it. Yeah. I try to go to as many places as I can now, you know, because you just never know when you won't be able to go someplace or someplace to be very different. So well, it wasn't money. Yeah. He, yeah. he was a physical therapy, uh -huh. traveled the United States, yeah. and uh, then used the money he earned to go. Yeah. And ate in every, every state of the union, except I think he's missing two. Yeah. Well. But, Marcy, did you have a question? Like a big adjustment, do you have to go through from being on that ship and then getting back on? Um, the biggest thing was um, I had sea legs when I came back. And so I remember for like a week, every time I was in bed, I felt like the bed was like going like this um, when I was in, in bed. Um, I just felt terrible um, when I came back because I was so sick. Uh, and... Yeah, so, um, like I said, I was trying to, like, hide all my symptoms and everything, I, and I made it back to Buenos Aires, but then I had, like, an eight-hour lay layover in Buenos Aires at the airport and just was miserable, 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 um, and didn't want to buy cold medicine because I was worried that, like, they might start asking questions, and so yeah. just kind of, yeah, was just felt bad, and then my aunt picked me up in Washington, D.C. at the airport when I came back, and I said, we're going to the fire station right away because I was like, I'm getting an IV. <laughs> yeah, because I was, yeah, so, so just felt terrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little over three weeks. Oh, in, in Antarctica itself? Um, we were in Antarctica itself for a week and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um... Well, one place that I would love to go, but I will not get to go. I should have gone way earlier. Um, I have always really wanted to go to Russia. I would have always wanted to see Moscow and St. Petersburg, but that just it's just not safe now. 
Um, so that will not happen. Um, big travel, like I would really like to go to Australia and New Zealand um, next. Um, so, yeah. It's very interesting. Like some places are much more comfortable to travel, it, meaning it's a little bit uh, culturally easier because it's more similar. So like the, the place that was the least similar was China. And that was a big adjustment for me. Um, the food was a big adjustment. Not having silverware was a big adjustment. Not being able to drink the water was a big adjustment. Like, yeah, lots of just, yeah. Um, so there are still places in Asia I would like to go, but it will be a little bit. <laughs> but there are other places I'd like to go first, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that I made it to, like, Israel when I could, yeah. I would like to go to other places in the Middle East, but I don't think that that will ever happen, yeah, so... Hello, yeah. Robbie. Can you hear us on Zoom? Yeah, hold on one second and I'll answer your oh, question. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah. I'll still be here if you have questions. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I can I can hear you now. Hey there. Yeah, I'm talking to you from Los Angeles. Oh wow. Hello from far away. Uh, congratulations. What a what a great experience for you and and how much you learned from the, the, the detail of the animals and the weather and the, uh, the, <laughs> the ocean currents and, and, and everything. And it's just uh, congratulations. I mean, and, and to get that whole trip for free yeah. uh, is, is truly amazing. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've done quite a bit of uh, travel myself around the world. And uh, I, I've been to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, you, you, you need to go there. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I I I learned a lot. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming.